what do you know? Another broken Volkswagen engine. In this video, we're gonna be tearing down this two liter turbo out of a Mark 7 GTI that allegedly has low compression on one cylinder. This engine was replaced under warranty, and while I don't know exactly how many miles it had, we can probably assume it's under 60,000. It looks like there might've been a little bit of teardown done already, as you can see from these bolts up here on top of the cam bridge. This has been sitting at the dealer for probably about two years, so it's been picked over a little bit. Normally on these teardowns, I work top to bottom, but in this one, we're gonna do it a little bit different. I am gonna start with taking the spark plugs out, but after that, I'm gonna roll it around and check the bottom end. So I have a hunch, I already know what's wrong with it. We'll go ahead and take a little quick look at these spark plugs. That one's missing. <laughs> okay, well, there's only one spark plug. So, so, so much for that. <laughs> Tech tip of the day, look at the spark plugs before you decide you're gonna take all the spark plugs out. So there was only one in there. Like I mentioned, this thing's kind of been picked over for parts. So someone probably grabbed a couple of spark plugs for testing. There's something else I'm gonna be doing different about this engine. Normally, when we take these apart, once I do that, the parts go to scrap. But on this one, I think I'm gonna actually save the engine and possibly rebuild it because I got a GTI race car type thing on the brain. So we'll see if that ever happens. Let's sit down. Okay, so uh, this GTI, in particular Mark 7, has a plastic oil pan. Sorry, composite. It doesn't look like this pan has been off before, but maybe it has. These composite pans actually hold up better than you would think. Okay, so the pan has definitely been off before, and I know that because, because there's no oil, there's no oil pickup, which is which is kind of weird. I bet during the teardown they never put it back in. That's my guess. There we go. So we got our windage tray here. That's still a little juicy. We have our oil pump. And what I thought would be the case is actually a piston ringland breaking. Hmm. While you guys wonder what I'm doing and not actually see anything, I'm just gonna rotate this around so I can show you. Ooh. Maybe it doesn't want to rotate upside down. Something's not happy. Okay, I think we're gonna roll this back around. It's gonna be harder to roll back around than it was to get here. We're gonna juice for sure on this one. Oh, look at that juicing. Ugh. Yeah, juice-tastic. I lost my bolt, there it is. What did I put it way over there for? Because I'm stupid, that's why. Kind of expected to see something on the bottom end. Now that doesn't mean that there's nothing on the bottom end. We can't really see piston one very well and I don't know which, which one had the problem. So we're just gonna kind of roll with it. I am gonna take the cam variators, or sorry, the cam adjuster solenoids off. We are missing some hardware for that. There is some yuck in the pan. I didn't even look in the pan. Why didn't I look in the pan a minute ago? I don't know if it's like, from this engine just sitting with like oil and coolant mixed together. I'm not gonna take into account too much the crusties. This one has cam timing adjustment on the intake and the exhaust, and then valve lift on the exhaust only. That's what these solenoids are for right here, which I'll show you what that looks like in a second because it's pretty cool. You guys ever taken apart an engine and like you knew something was real sad with it? It has a very distinct smell. Uh, I don't know how to describe said smell. Get our upper timing. <laughs> well, I think I figured out why our engine wouldn't rotate around. As soon as I got the cover off, this is what I found. See the chain is off our exhaust cam. My assumption is there was tear down done and they just didn't put it back all the way, right? Like, look at that, that bolt's not tight right there. That bolt's not tight. These two right here aren't tight. That one's not tight, so. My, these I took out right here. These are for the solenoid. The only reasonable assumption we can make is that it was taken apart and just not put back together all the way. Let's go ahead and get our PCV and our cam bridge off next. If you're concerned about an issue with cylinder three or four, popping this PCV valve off 
is a good spot to like do a quick visual. And you gotta take it off anyway to get all the bolts to the cambridge off. There is also, real quick, <laughs> this is important. There is also a sequence you have to do to set the exhaust cam slider positions. You'll see the sliders in a second, where you take certain solenoids out and install these little tools, rotate the engine around, and that puts the slider and the exhaust cam in a certain spot. We can't rotate the engine around, so there's no point in even trying that. You can definitely tell that those were just kind of snugged in. They were really inconsistently tight. All right, let's get that guy out of the way. Oh yeah. A lot of what we find here may depend on what we do. Our valve train looks all right. Let's go ahead and pull our bridge off next. Spool valves, ooh, do I have that spool valve tool? I should have done the spool valve first. There are a couple of different tools for taking these valves out. You need to make sure you get the right one. I think there's actually three different ones. Luckily for me, these weren't tight because I would have been I would have been in a dilly of a pickle if these were tight. These are also counter threaded, reverse threaded, if you will. So uh, you need to rotate them clockwise to get them out. There we go. Finally, 87 years later, we'll talk about those in a minute. This bridge off of here, right? Now we should be able to get our chain off. It's okay that it's not quite right. That's not a problem. Pull our cams, do a quick inspection of. Come on, man. So it's it's really obvious to me that this engine has been apart, okay? Like apart, apart. And um, you're gonna like what I just found. Now, when I say um, I'm like laughing about this and kind of poking fun, I'm I'm not hating on the tech that took this apart and then put it back together because under warranty, you're not gonna get paid to like properly reassemble this this engine. So there's really little incentive to do anything but get it back together enough to send it back. I mean, really, like they'll pay you to take it down, but they don't pay to put it back together and you can't just send back a box of parts. So with the cams out, here is our valve train. I did find one kind of yuck spot right there. I don't know if that would prevent me from using this engine, especially in like a race car application or anything like that, but it is something to take note. Now, the thing that I was laughing about that I noticed, we're standing on the front side of the engine. Here's the water pump. If we were engine in car, this is how we would be looking at it. So this cam that was right here is our intake cam. Cam back here is our exhaust cam. If you look at the rollers on the rockers for the exhaust cam, look at how narrow they are, right? You can see the the little bearing sticking out the side. Let's come down to these on the intake side and look at how fat they are. They're like, probably not twice as thick, but quite a bit thicker. Cylinder one exhaust, cylinder one intake. Let's side by side these babies. Just, there you go, side by side, see how different they are. <laughs> when, when, when I was looking, so cylinder one is right here. This is cylinder two, rut row, that doesn't go there. Cylinder three's got a little of A and a little of B, and then cylinder four does too. Little A, little B. So proper, then this one should be on the exhaust side. It's not a big deal. Like, it's really not. It's just, it's funny. And I wanted to share the joke with you. Let's take a quick look at our cams while we're here. This is the intake cam with our variator here. You can see our lobes. This is our cam bridge. This acts as oil controls. These are oil galleys or oil galleries if you prefer. Uh, here's where our solenoids mount up. It looks like three bolts or two bolts broke. Look at a broken bolt and a broken bolt. And that one came out. So we'll have to extract those or put another bridge on it. This is a common failure point, not so much on these, but on the older ones, there was a screen and all this was covered up and the screen would come apart and get lodged in one of these two holes right here and starve the backside of the head for oil. This is our exhaust cam. So it has timing variation. That's what this is and that's controlled on both intake and exhaust with this spool valve right here. The magnet acts on it, and then it directs oil flow to move the gear independent from the shaft. This one also has variable valve lift. If you look right there, you can see there's two different lobes. There's a low lift lobe, and then right behind it is a high lift lobe, and this piece right here slides. I'm not gonna slide it because if I slide it, there's a ball and a spring that's gonna go, well, actually two I think, that's gonna go pewing and it's gonna go shoo, and right over there into the Audi and it'll never be found again. 
So we're not gonna do that. Just a standard operating PCV valve. We'll take these three bolts out and then, oh, I saw that little bit of red and I thought I cut my finger. And then we'll take the head bolts out next. Let's go ahead and crack these head bolts loose. Oh, they're not even tight. Okay, we don't even need this thing. Just seems like a lot of teardown to do. Likely the head was pulled because I couldn't find anything on the bottom end. And in order to pull the upper oil pan, the non-metal, or the metal, excuse me, the aluminum oil pan, you have to take the trans out because there's a couple of bolts on the, the two bolts. Because of two bolts, you gotta take the transmission out uh, on the rear main seal. So that's probably why, but man, oh man. Seems like a lot of teardown work. And then ultimately, just to put an engine in it anyway. I don't see any sadness there. <laughs> okay. Here's what I'm gonna do. I see the sadness. It opened up my eyes, saw the sadness. That looks like oil control ring to me. That looks like compression ring. That looks like bits of piston. How did it get up on the top side though? They must have put it down in there. There's no way all that would end up in the top side without like Serious, serious cylinder damage. Let's go ahead and rotate this around and get it set up to take the upper oil pan off. And I'm gonna try and catch this stuff that's gonna fall out of cylinder one. Oh, that's the chain. There we go. Bits, bits. All right. Let's get our oil pump off. Oh yeah, easy, easy. Here's our oil pump, nothing fancy. Very consistent oil pump with the rest of these EA triple eight engines. They're all really same. Also, this is pretty much, pretty much the engine in my Golf R. Even on the newest gen, like the next gen, it's real similar. I mean, VW and Audi have been using this style and other brands across the world, Skoda, Seat. I, I feel like I do a, Good job leaving y'all out. And it's not intentional. They've been using this style of engines forever. Not forever, since like 08 and a half. So right back here, there's two bolts that hold the rear main seal on. I went ahead and took them off and took the rear main seal off because I knew we'd be taking this pan off. If those two bolts didn't exist, you could take this upper pan off without taking the tran transmission out. But since those exist, I take the transmission out. Now I have seen guys just destroy the rear main seal knowing they were gonna put another one in, just like on a diag, but ultimately it probably doesn't matter. That's our upper oil pan. We got more chunkage right here. That's a chunk. You know, that was in cylinder one, but it makes me wonder, is that the cylinder that had the problem? Or did they just throw it in there because it was convenient? Oh no, that's definitely from <laughs> cylinder one. The good thing is I don't see a ton of metal in here. Let's go ahead and take cylinder one piston and connecting rod and all that out. Should have got a bigger ratchet for that. Let's see. Our bearing looks good. A little bit of wear, but nothing, nothing I'm super worried about. Okay, it was in fact, <laughs> cylinder one, you can see the rings right here. There's supposed to be more metal right here than just that. Cylinder one piston ring land blew out. This is actually a pretty common thing. Normally from what I've seen, it's cylinder two or cylinder three, but that's, that's kind of irrelevant. These are just cast pistons. There's nothing special about these. Odds are, now I, I can't, I don't know this. Look, this is part of the piston ring. I don't know this for sure. But on the other ones that, I, <laughs> that I've seen, the car has been tuned and it's a low speed pre-ignition issue and it just blows the ring land apart. This one's broken pretty good. Like I've seen it where here on the other side, just the bottom for the oil control ring breaks and you'll get some blow by and a little bit of misfire under heavy load. This one's pretty nuked. So it was probably, probably a zero compression concern. As I get this engine put back together, I want to look at two additional things. One, 
what the heck is low speed pre-ignition anyway? And two, could you just slap a piston in this engine and send it? Or does this require a complete rebuild? Low speed pre-ignition becomes common on smaller turbocharged engines that are direct injection, which means we're putting fuel right into the cylinder instead of older technologies where the fuel went into the intake and then into the cylinder. Low speed pre-ignition is basically a premature combustion event, which means that the air fuel mixture inside the cylinder is igniting at the wrong time. This results in incredibly high cylinder pressures, which lead to knock, which then can lead to our issue we have here. Now, in a mild case of low-speed pre-ignition, you could just get a little bit of engine noise, a little bit of knock. The ECM in general will take care of that and you won't have any problem. However, when it gets bad, <laughs> we end up with a piston that looks like this one. In my experience, this is not a super common thing on these two liter engines. And the majority of them that I've seen have been on tuned cars. That does not mean that this can't happen on a normal stock car. I've just seen more of this happen on cars that have an ECM tune. So you wanna make sure you're doing good maintenance, proper oil changes, good quality fuel, and then make sure you smash that gas pedal every once in a while. Let's face it, that's kind of the fun of a GTI anyway. Now let's look at what a pair would be for this engine. Could you just replace this one piston and be okay? And the short answer is yes, you could. Now that doesn't mean in every situation a piston is going to fix this problem. Thorough inspections of the cylinder wall and the rest of the engine is gonna really need to be done. If it blew this piston apart and destroyed the cylinder wall, you're probably better off with another engine rather than doing all the work it's gonna take to fix the engine block to accept a piston. Unless you want to overboard and put bigger pistons in it, another engine is probably the right answer. I'm going to be lightly putting this engine back together so that I can use it for a future project. Most likely my plan will be to upgrade engine internals, including rods, including pistons, probably valve springs. I could see a scenario in the future where a track GTI exists in my fleet. Now that's not going to be a cheap endeavor and anytime you build anything for a race car, it gets really expensive and something in searching the parts prices I had no idea went up in price so much is the rear main seal for this car. These things used to be like 50 bucks, now they're $250. So this could easily, especially with going with forged internals, turn into a $4,000 plus dollar engine build. That's just in parts by the time we add on hardware and gaskets and everything else we'll need. I got a lot of options for this engine, but for now, I think it's just going to go into storage and I'll figure out what to do with it later, but it sounds like I better not sleep on buying these parts because they are not getting any cheaper. I also did pull the water pump off of this engine so that we could do a video on how this electronically controlled thermostat and water pump actually work. In typical fashion, it's considerably over-engineered, but it's also pretty cool how it works. If you guys have any questions or comments, drop them down below. With that, I'm out. Have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you again next time.